HVAC, a hybrid approach. This video is another exploration from strategies for deploying virtual representations of the built environment. Whole building simulation tools offer a number of approaches to representing environmental controls. Different approaches are useful at different stages of the design process. We often use idealized approaches early in the design to test what-if scenarios and to understand the demand response characteristics of the systems we're using and the rooms they're placed in. For example, various placements of sensors, perhaps radiant convection mix of sensors or actuators. Control engineers can look at sticky controllers, tuning of PID controllers, and changes in scheduling. Limited inputs allow us to confirm ideas prior to attempting a full component representation. ESPR uses a censure actuator control law description for ideal approaches. In the example on the right, the sensor is in the air node and the actuator is within the floor construction, and the method computes how much flux needs to be delivered to satisfy the control logic. A pure convection actuator would be a quick stand-in for an air-based environmental control. There are a range of control laws available. Some are abstract and some reflect specific characteristics of equipment. For example, some have limits on how often they cycle. The PI or PID controller can mimic poorly tuned controls. And the many issues with master-slave controls can also be explored. More information about ideal controls can be found in the link shown. A component-based approach involves the creation of a network of interlinked components representing a fully evolved design. Many components require attributes which are difficult to source, but what we get from this is a fully dynamic solution which can track the thermophysical state at multiple points within components and do so on a second-by-second -second basis if required. Considerable skills are needed to correctly select and link components. It is far less ad hoc than the creation of flow networks. It's really not very forgiving for novices. Linking plant components and flow components is a puzzle that eludes most practitioners. That leaves a gap in simulation approaches, which this video explores. The elephant in the room is that HVAC relies on the movement of conditioned air to do its job. HVAC is constrained by, among other things, the limited heat capacity of air and the limited range of air temperatures which can be delivered. Some of the heat or cooling gets lost in transit. The temperature at the coil and at the register in the room can differ considerably. A single air handler may deliver to several rooms and thus we are confronted by the classic issues of master-slave controls. If we use ceiling voids as plenums, then we're dealing with an aggregate of temperature, humidity, and contaminants from multiple return grills. The mass of the floor structure above the ceiling void may also come into play. If we used raised floors and floor registers, similar actions also come into play, complicating the performance of the system. Given the above, it's quite possible that an ideal controller for HVAC will inject or extract more flux than is actually realistically possible. Where simulation tools provide templates for component systems, how well might they cope with the interactions and exceptions implicit in the items just discussed. Getting to a final HVAC design is not necessarily a linear process and sometimes early information is particularly critical. For example, I deliver workshops for Passive House practitioners. Passive House has extreme design goals including the demand for near silent ventilation systems with very low fan power requirements. That's quite a rarity in conventional engineering. 
and yet one could deliver a system with lower flow velocities and minimal pressure docks as long as adequate space has been reserved early enough in the design process. Getting early indications of spatial requirements for ducting is one of many design tasks which are not well served by current approaches. Could we address the elephant in the room by using air movement by way of a mass flow network as the transport medium and perhaps altering the resolution of our model? This video explores a hybrid approach which draws on existing simulation entities and solvers to implement intermediate representations of constant volume and variable air volume environmental controls in a portion of an office building used for ESBR training. If we open up the exemplar, we have two small cellular offices joined to a passage. Furniture and fittings are included. The air of the glass and the facade composition tends to result in summer overheating and brief pulses of heating to bring the room back up to set point after the night setback. The control used in the exemplar model is basically one control for all of the zones with different patterns on weekdays, Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. If we go and look, we've got a convective environmental control that's sensing the temperature of the air um, and actuating at the air node. And the basic controller is being used, uh, fixing the capacity for heating and cooling, as well as a heating and cooling set points which vary between occupied hours and overnight. Uh, you can see that there is a considerable dead band between, say, 15 degrees and 26 degrees at night where the temperature will float. Let's make variants of this model that allow us to explore some outside-of-the-box HVAC options. So as we fade from the initial to the revised model, Let's go over the differences that might be incorporated. The goal of the exercise is to avoid premature descents into the details of the air handler until we have determined the efficacy of our initial flow rates and control logic. Thus, volume flow rate components are preferable to specifying specific fan curve performance curves. The first addition is a zone to represent the mixing box. It will host the controls needed to condition the air, as well as acting as an air handler. The original model had flow attributes for infiltration and interzone air movement. The revised model will use additional surfaces for the flow attributes. These flow attributes will be taken into account when the airflow network is being created. The mixing box zone includes an open grill from the plenum, as well as an inlet for the fresh air makeup. The manager's office has two additional surfaces in the ceiling to represent the inlet from the air handler and the return grill to the ceiling void. The passage also has an added inlet surface and a surface for the return grill. We've also added another zone for the ceiling void. It has a cemented ceiling at the base and a concrete slab on the top and includes surfaces matching the inlets and grills in the adjacent zones, as well as the air handler, so the air handler is actually a zone within a zone. The flow paths are a fresh air supply at 30 cubic meters per hour per person into the mixing box by way of a mechanical ventilation inlet. We also need to balance the fresh air inlet Otherwise, we would have an overpressure situation and some forced losses by way of cracks in the facade. We'll also have volume flow rate components from the mixing box to the inlet surfaces in each office and the passage. These will have flow control logic added to them to deliver air either as a constant volume or a variable air volume. The return grills in each room and the return grill in the mixing blocks 
takes care of the return path. The Create Network from Surface Attributes facility will be used to create the flow network, and it will ask us about the width of the cracks and the door undercuts, as well as the flow rates for mechanical ventilation inlets. These images show the generated flow connections related to each of the rooms. Let's look at the control logic. We will use a multi-sensor ideal controller to inject or extract heat in the mixing box based on conditions in the offices. We've got one mixing box supplying three rooms, thus we have a classic master-slave controller. If one office needs heating, then all the rooms get heated air. If cooling's needed in either office, the mixing box air is cooled. If one room needs heating and one room needs cooling, nothing happens. If both rooms are within the dead band, nothing happens. Let's review this in the project manager. So in the project manager, we go into zone controls. There is one loop, which is associated with the mixing box. It has different schedules for different days of the year we look into it, we get a report about the attributes within um, the mixing box on the different day types and different periods of the day. Essentially, we've got uh, four kilowatts of heating, two and a half kilowatts of cooling, and we're setting a Yes, here's our multi-sensor controller for this period starting at zero. Here's our capacities. We are going to allow it to get up to 50 degrees and down to 15 degrees in for the tempering. And there are two auxiliary sensors, one of which is in the first office, which is the zone one. And the rest of the values are zero for there. And we'll want it to heat to 17 degrees and cool if it gets above 26 degrees. Now, the first period in the day is unoccupied, so it's got a broader range of temperatures. Same thing um, for the other office. So that we've got three periods there. So let's exit from this control. And go and look at the flow. Now, we're looking here at the constant air volume model, which has four control loops. One of which is for the fresh air in, one of them is for the exhaust, and then we've got a controller for each of the managers. So fresh air in, these attributes relate to checking this which, which component and which connection within the flow network. And then we've got this on off pattern uh, with partial time overnight and then full flow rate to for starting from seven o'clock in the morning. Same sort of thing for the exhaust. We've got the same timings so that we, we run at a fraction overnight and then ramp up to the amount we want during office hours. If we go to the manager itself, we uh, are controlling the, in the flow rate into the inlet with that component. And then basically we've got three periods in the day. We're using a range-based controller to uh, set flow rates high if it's outside the set points and low to what if it is within the dead band. If we look at the VAV variant model, the zone control for the mixing box is actually the same as it is um, for the constant volume, so that there's no change there. It still behaves the same way. However, 
the flow rates will change. So we go and look at the flow controllers for the VAV. There's no change in the air handler for the fresh air in or the exhaust return. That still behaves in the same way. However, if you go into the manager, we then have a proportional controller three different times of the day with a set point in, of 18, 21, and back to 18. We have a proportional band um, to apply of two degrees. So in the middle of the day, here's our proportional controller, PI control, starting at seven, and here are our values for it. The 600 is a, is a reset um, time in seconds. So, and we will use a direct action for that controller. And we will base it on the sensor for this particular loop. Similar pattern in the other office. So, how well did it work? Let's start with the constant air volume variant and open up the predictions for that. So if you look at the occupied spaces and the ceiling void and in graphs, go and plot the air temperature inside and draw that for the period. Again, we have the classic ratcheting, which we would expect from an on-off controller. Let's focus down on a shorter period of time, from the 7th to, say, the 9th, and redraw that again. Okay, now it's clearer what's going on. We're relatively stable. We're within the uh, dead band during the afternoon. Here's our period of occasional on and offs to maintain temperatures and another set of on offs as we come up to the set point. And then a slow drop off overnight and look at network flows. Let's see about the volume flow rate in meters cubed per hour for the connections from the air handler to the manager and air handler to the manager B and to the corridor. So again, we've got these classic on-off cycles as when the heating is required, um, we have a flow. When it's satisfied, we drop back down to the basic rate. If we look at the inquire about, and we focus in on the air handler, then the energy delivered over the period, 22.56 kilowatt hours. So a little bit of cooling that's kicked on because we overshoot. So what's the performance of the VAV? Now the only thing that changed was the flow control logic, going from on-off controller to a proportional controller. So if we look at the temperatures in the rooms, we again have some ratcheting. It is somewhat 
different than the other because we've got these 18, 21 degree set points and a two degree proportional band. But let's focus in on the same period as we did in the on-off controller and have a look in more detail. Now there are differences. The throttling again is within this two degree range, but we definitely see some differences in the performance. If we look at the air handler and the temperatures in it, we see that um, temperatures rarely go above 30 to 32 degrees. Um, and there are, uh, again, pattern is somewhat different than for the on-off controller. If we look at the flow rates in the same locations in meters cubed per hour between the air handler and the manager A and the air handler and the manager B and the to the corridor. It does look like there's an awful lot of on-offing, but there is also a gradual slope up at the start of times. Here's a different period. Um, again, you can see the slope up being a little bit different and the it takes rather more heating, cooling energy, but there is very little on the cooling. So why do we see some ratcheting? Well, both the models use the default heat transfer coefficient regime, Alamdari and Hammond, and that's not really a good fit for rooms with 8-vatch. We will look at that in the next video.